Hello, everybody. You are listening to the Natural Healing Show for UK Health Radio. I'm your host, Katherine Kerrigan, medical intuitive healer and Amazon number one bestselling author. You can find out more about me and my work at KatherineKerrigan.com and UnlimitedEnergyNow.com. While you're there, definitely sign up for my newsletter. You're going to get a lot of free deals and find out more about natural healing. Now, our guest today is Taryn, the traveling trainer. Taryn Hoff is a personal trainer, video blogger, web podcaster, retired professional wrestler, and part-time Georgia State University instructor. You can find out more about him and his work at GoTerran.com, and that's go t a r r y n dot com. Welcome, Taryn Hawk. Hey, Catherine. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Now, Taryn, how long have you actually been a personal trainer? Because you're somebody we can all listen to because you've been doing this work for so long. Yeah. Uh, Technically, I've been a personal trainer for, let's see, 18 years consecutively. 1999 is when I had my first client after being certified. Yeah, so you really are a master trainer. Yeah, I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) So, Taryn, what is sarcopenia and why is it such an important problem in our Western culture and for people as we age? Oh, yeah. Okay. Good question. Sarcopenia, Catherine. So uh, I went back into, you know, my textbooks, my undergrad, because a lot of information uh, can be found readily available, not only, you know, in clinical settings from doctors, but also, you know, uh, the textbooks show and research and evidence shows how important it is, um, you know, specifically talking about sarcopenia, for example. Uh, Basically, it's a degenerative loss of uh, skeletal muscle mass, you know, Um, there's ways that people can uh, get tested uh, for sarcopenia and bone density loss and muscle mass uh, degeneration, you know, things like osteopenia, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, things of that nature. But there's different uh, symptoms and signs that people need to know about. And specifically, is it, uh, you know, progresses worse, uh, it could develop into severe sarcopenia. And the three classifications of those to look for are uh, low physical performance, low muscular strength, and low muscular mass. So definitely people need to make sure they're getting that checked out. Now, is it actually true that we lose muscle as we age? Yes. uh, Unfortunately, that is the truth. All of us, none of us are exempt to that. The only way to combat that is through exercise, through strength training and bodybuilding, uh, because on average, after age 50, we're losing about 1% of muscle mass per age, uh, per year, as we um, continue to age, and that doesn't stop. And uh, that's just one of those things like gravity, that it's always going to be tangible and out there, and there's just, um, we can do things to combat, combat it, and that's why I try to encourage clients out there and my students when I'm teaching, you know, that uh, don't give up. It's never too late. You know, the whole cliche of, uh, quote, younger next year. And that's why we got to do something now to uh, do as much preventative maintenance as we can. So, again, tell us, you know, a lot of people go, well, you know, I don't really care about what my muscles are doing. I only care about what I look like or even what I feel like. Why is sarcopenia such a problem? Good question, Catherine. So what it comes down to is uh, two issues that sarcopenia can uh, lead into. And and what we want to watch out for are initial uh, decrease of muscle mass and also as we're aging, decreased uh, muscle mass in our body. And that's why uh, when people are, you know, I don't have time to work out or exercise, I don't need to, to weight train. And it's a whole misconception of, oh, I don't want to get big and bulky and, you know, People don't have to do that if they're working out smartly. You know, if your program is not customized to bulk up, quote, uh, you know, on a power uh, muscular uh, program, that's fine. You can do lean muscle body, uh, high resistance or HIT, you know, high HIIT, HIT interval uh, intensity training and things like that or CrossFit. There's a lot of things to do that. But the whole thing of muscles in the first place is that the only way they'll strengthen is to break them down. I know it sounds crazy, but. Uh, the ways that you build muscle is by actually breaking the fibers down, and that's how they strengthen. It's like anything else that's durable or pliable. Uh, it's kind of like iron sharpening iron, right? If you're in the gym or in the fitness center, you have to do these things to get stronger. And so what I tell those folks, no matter what age they are, 
um, again, it's very crucial and vital to do that, um, not only physiologically for, um, you know, battling things like sarcopenia and uh, increasing their muscle mass, but also the fact that it's just going to, uh, you know, help with things like uh, joint pain, prevention of being in pain, longevity, uh, living a life to where you just feel great. You know, none of us out there want the opposite. You know, we should all be wanting to live a long life and being able to uh, enjoy life pain free for the most part. And that's why, Catherine, you know, you know that better than anyone else with what you do. So I'm just preaching the choir here, I guess. <laughs> okay. So, so Taryn, once we understand that sarcopenia is muscle loss associated with the normal processes of aging, what do you think as, as a master trainer with 18 years experience, what do you think the minimum amount of strength training someone can quote unquote get away with? Because some people don't like to exercise. And what do you think is the optimum level of strength training? Okay, Catherine, great questions. Um, you know, the first point of it, how many times in a week that uh, I think that is the uh, minimal amount is at least two to three days a week, preferably with a day of rest if they're working that certain muscle group area, which for example, I'm gonna get on a program. If I'm new to exercise, I wanna get into the gym and start doing weights. I'm gonna do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I'm gonna work the same muscle group areas, do a total body workout, concentrating on the bigger muscles like chest, back, legs, abdomen, and core. And I'm going to repeat that after a day of full 48-hour consecutive, you know, two-day rest, period. And uh, the second part of the question, what I tell my clients is optimum as far as strength training, is what I try to do myself. And that's as much uh, during the week as possible. I try to maintain for myself four to five days of strength training a week because I do a little different rigorous program where I attack the muscle and I just try to confuse it and shock it differently because every single workout I do myself is completely different than the previous one. And I do that always trying to maintain balance and symmetry. If I'm uh, doing a certain amount of, let's say, chest exercises, I want to make sure that I'm doing equal, if not probably more, back exercises because, Catherine, you've seen me in person and you know my issue is what I have with the kyphosis because I'm always hunched forward and leaning forwards. And so what I try to do for myself, and you taught me this, Catherine, I learned from you, is the better posture and building more back strengthening exercises, such as the ones that you had me on. And that's what I try to tell my clients too. Whenever I'm working with clients, I'm just telling them, look, if you're going to get in the gym and do the strength training, don't be afraid of it. Don't be intimidated because a lot of people when they're in the fitness center and they're new to it, especially the older people who are over 50 and dealing with things that could lead to things like sarcopenia and uh, the rest of the things we've been talking about. This is some of the things that's preventative me medicine. Exercise is medicine. And, and that's why I encourage, again, just to throw another uh, book out there, uh, Younger Next Year. They've got it uh, right down, you know, to the wire, to a science. And, and your books, too. Anyone listening, you know, th the research is out there, as we said. The books, the textbooks, everything is uh, it's just a matter of education and getting people to know, you know, learn the knowledge out there. All right, so if the minimum that we need to build our muscles and maintain our muscles as we age is two to three times a week, and the optimum is four to five times a week, how long do these strength training needs, sessions need to be uh, minimum and optimum? Okay, uh, very good question, Catherine. So what I do when I break it down, and my students will tell you at Georgia State too, I say the acronym F-I-T-T -T all the time because, again, that's straight out of the – one of my favorite textbooks, Get Fit, Stay Fit, is one of the ones I'm teaching from. Uh, F-I-T-T -T stands for Frequency, Intensity, Time, and Type. I'm sure uh, most people listening to this know exactly what that is, but let's answer the question a little further here. So frequency, which we'll you know get to a little bit, I'm sure, is how many times a week that we're going to be doing it, which we just talked about was minimum of two to three, optimally four to five. Intensity level is going to be your resistance level, like uh, how hard you're going to be attacking that muscle. Again, we'll get to that a little bit more further detail. Uh, time, to answer your question here, duration of the workout session, I would say that at a minimum, you could effectively get a good strength training routine down in 30 minutes, but I like to budget 45 minutes to an hour personally for myself and my, for my clients because I like to attack it to an efficient three sets of 12 to 15 repetitions. And that way, from when I'm doing that, I, I just find that you're going at a normal, good, rigorous rate, uh, rate during the workout session and pace. I think that 45 minutes to an hour is completely doable. I think everybody has that amount of time in a day to be able to uh, budget out and carve. And then the fourth T that I said, type, 
which again, we'll talk about is modality. What kind of workout are you going to be doing? All right. Now, so that's great information. So when, when people lose muscle, how does that affect their metabolism? Good question, Catherine. Okay. So it correlates hand in hand uh, with uh, muscle and metabolism loss, uh, et cetera. It's a inverse correlation. Uh, your metabolism is going to slow down and go down the more muscle density that we lose because as we age, that's one of the factors that we, again, uh, can try to control, but we have no total uh, control over. Our metabolism is going to slow down as we age. And the ways to keep that up is to keep our muscle mass uh, up there. That's why uh, when doctors uh, prescribe anything kind of treatments towards something like sarcopenia, first thing they're going to ask is how much exercising and how much strength training one is doing. And that's what they're going to recommend them first. They're going to tell them the minimum, what I just said, at least two to three days of strength training uh, needs to be done. And in turn, that's going to regulate and boost that metabolism to metabolism, excuse me, and from slowing down and kind of getting back on a pace to where it needs to go. Because on top of that, we also have our basal metabolism rate, right? BMR during the day, how many calories we're burning at rest. Like you and I right now, we're burning minimal calories. And that is our metabolism is just going at a rate because you and I are both into working out and exercising. Whereas someone else who's sitting down and talking are probably going to be burning a lot, lot less basal metabolism because at rest, their metabolism is working a lot slower. Again, Using you and I as an example, Catherine, we both exercise, we both strength train, you do yoga and a whole bunch of other, you know, core exercises. I try to do the different kind of, you know, um, weight training and such and dumbbells and bodybuilding. And so sitting here right now, effectively, we are burning good calories because our metabolism is a little faster. The way to increase that and get that metabolism up, got to get out there and hit the weights, got to uh, get in the gym and work out. That's as simple as that. Now. Again, we're, if you're listening to this program, you're a day older today than you were <laughs> yesterday. Yeah, that's correct. What actually causes this sarcopenia? Okay, so let's take a look at the three causes. And I want to cite one thing too. Since this is germane and relevant to the folks, our friends out there in the UK, there's something called the European Working Group on Sarcopenia in Older People. The acronym is EWGSOP. Any of our UK friends listening out there, I'm sure they know that acronym. And they classify it into three areas right here for diagnosis, okay? The three areas would be tested when we feel like there are signs and symptoms affecting us. And these are the three. There are low muscle mass, and that's something that you can get tested when you go into the doctor's office. Uh, they use a machine, the acronym is DEXA. It's a dual energy X-ray absorption uh, you know, machine. That's what uh, pretty much measures lean body tissue, lean muscle mass. I deal with a lot of clients who go into that when they go to the doctor's office because they want to know what their body fat percentage is. Well, on the flip side, it'll tell you what their muscle mass is, and the doctors can determine if that is uh, losing since last time they measured it. So that's one, lo lo uh, muscle mass uh, loss. Number two, they actually measure their gait speed. If they have a slower walking speed, they're done that on a walking test. So they'll usually put them on a treadmill, and again, the walking speed will be at 0.8 miles per second, and they'll be able to determine, okay, how slow are they walking in their gait. Number three is low muscular strength, and the way that they test that is with a hand dynamometer to where they can check what their grip strength is, and usually they check in to see can they grip more than 30 uh, kilograms in males or more than 20 kilograms in females. So those are the three ways when you go into the doctor's office and you check that's what they're going to probably do for both the U.S. and UK, uh, U.K., but also, again, this was initiated by the, uh, uh, again, just using the acronym EWGSOP, our European friends out there. Now, some of our listeners out there may go, well, you know, I don't want to go to the gym, but maybe I'll go for a walk. Why is walking alone not adequate for helping us to cope with sarcopenia? Yeah. Good question, Catherine. Okay, so walking is an aerobic exercise by definition. Aerobic exercise will not help at all with sarcopenia. So therefore, by default, uh, it's not valid enough, okay? So we know that we need to do what's called anaerobic exercising, uh, AKA like a strength uh, training exercise, okay? If you're swimming, swimming's kind of in the middle. That might do a little bit of help because especially for the people who already have things like osteoarthritis, or joint pain or a breakdown of bone cartilage. And they feel like, you know, I know some clients who have absolutely um, no solution but to get in the swimming pool as their modality of exercise. And that's okay. 
what they're going to do, the good, good news on that, just using that, for example, grab the weighted dumbbells in the pool and do some dips, do some bicep curls, get down and do some squats in the pool. I mean, there are ways and methods to do strength training in the swimming pool. And then you can do some laps and do some chest flies and butterflies, et cetera, you know, different kinds of uh, swimming uh, exercises that they have. But for strength, for aerobic exercise, for walking alone, um, yeah, I commend that as a great exercise in general to burn body fat and to increase cardiovascular respiratory endurance. However, we're talking about muscle mass right now. So in terms of increasing strength and muscular endurance, the only way to do that is to actually either get in the gym, hit the weights, do the dumbbells, or if you can't make it to the fitness center, you don't have a gym membership, or you know, what have you, great, do it at home. Get on the floor, get on your knees, do some push-ups. You can't do it there, get on the wall and do some wall push-ups. For every exercise that we're talking about, there is an alternative and a modification. And we both know that, Catherine. So if no matter what age uh, we're dealing with or one person's uh, physical fitness level, they can do it. So anyone listening out there, you can do your strength training exercise. There's just plenty of ways to do it. And free information out there, by the way, as well. Now, Taryn, I know that you make a lot of videos. Are there strength training videos on your website, gotaryn.com? Yes, Catherine, thanks. Um, absolutely. You know, what I do a lot of times uh, with fun is through Instagram uh, because it's quick. It's a, uh, Instagram allows you to post up to a one-minute video. So if people check out my Instagram link, which is from gotaren.com, you just click on that, you will actually see a different exercise of the day that I'll post on there. And it's less than a minute. So everybody's got less than a minute to just go on there and click on it. And I'll actually pick out some of my very favorite exercises to do. Uh, and on top of that, most of the exercises, by the way, do not involve a fit, piece of fitness equipment. Most of them are a functional uh, exercise or a weight-bearing suspended exercise where you're actually sometimes might have a ball, you know, or, you know, just using a TRX or so, something like that. But it's not involving like a real expensive piece of gym equipment. It's something that people can either do at home or in the gym with uh, most fitness centers would have these pieces of equipment. But that's my favorite. I love to do functional exercises because as we age and as we get older, there are things that we need to do functionally speaking that are going to help us later on in life. Okay. No. We've heard about osteopenia and osteoarthritis as well as osteoporosis. What is the difference between osteopenia, osteoarthritis, and osteoporosis? Okay, good question, Catherine. So we've talked good amount of sarcopenia here, okay? Sarcopenia sounds like almost like osteopenia. If you notice the word penia in the end from Greek and from Latin, it actually means poverty. It actually means without. So hence, if you break it down in layman's terms and you talk about osteo bone, you know, uh, basically osteoarthritis is one of the things that is a precursor and that could lead to that. So osteopenia, uh, on the other hand, on the flip side, is where we have lo loss of bone density, okay? With osteoarthritis, what we've got to be careful of, osteoarthritis is a joint disease, and that's where you break down the bones and you talk about joint cartilage problems and such. And, uh, and the difference between uh, osteoporosis, that's what it could lead into. So whenever a doctor's doing those kind of bone density tests and they're having, and again, I'm not trying to uh, single out women, but it usually predominantly is women that have to deal with these issues because they just suffer at it at a greater rate as we age. Do men? Yes, certainly we do. Uh, and again, there are ways that they test that. And again, there's a lot of ways that they could figure out, okay, this is what it's leading to. If you have osteopenia, that could lead to osteoporosis or which could lead to osteoarthritis. And, they t and you know, uh, the umbrella of all of those, the beautiful thing is what we've just been talking about here. Exercise, exercise, exercise. They're going to tell you, strength, train. You need to break down that muscle fiber so that it can get stronger. And we need to get in the gym and work out the muscles wherever we're suffering. And again, what I'm saying right now is very common. Unfortunately, a lot of the people that I see that I deal with uh, suffer from that. And especially, I'm sure you too, Catherine, we see it across the board in our senior population. Um, the average age is 67 or above when it starts to develop into those kind of diseases as, uh, such as osteoarthritis. Now, Taryn, if somebody was listening to this and th thought, you know, okay, Taryn is really making a lot of sense. You know, I need to do some strength training. If somebody is going to start out strength training what are the basic exercises that you recommend that person start out with for that basic 30-minute strength training workout? 
Okay, yeah, g good question, Catherine. So assuming that they've cleared a physical activity readiness questionnaire, a health history form, uh, assuming that the doctor's given them clearance and we've already sat down and gone over that with them and they're ready to go into the gym, um, there's three basic exercises that I like to give them when I first meet them because that helps me test um, to see how their strength is and it assesses their core strength, their upper body muscular strength, and then also their muscular endurance in the legs too. So the reason why I choose these three, Catherine, is because they are used across the board in the YMCA protocol and ACSM guidelines when we're doing a fitness assessment initially. So for example, when I take the client in and I say, okay, here are the three exercises I'm going to give you right now. You're going to do three sets of 15 repetitions on all three of these in 30 minutes, um, you know, in between after a warm up and stretching and a cool down. I'm going to take them through and get them on the floor and start with push-ups, just basic push-up. I mentioned if they could do push-ups on their hands and on their toes, great. If they can't, we'll try it on the knees. Uh, they can't do it there, that's okay. We're going to put the legs up on a ball and see if they could do it there. If they can't do it there, we're going to stand them up on a wall and do some wall push-ups. We're going to make sure they could do those push-ups to test out muscular strength and endurance in the upper body. Secondly to that, back to the legs for a second, we're going to do some step-ups on a box 18-inch step. Okay, so. Uh, for example, the YMCA three-minute step test is to uh, see what their uh, cardiorespiratory endurance is. Me, I want to wor really work out those. Uh, one of the best exercises to do for legs across the board, it's going to work the glutes, the quadriceps, the hamstrings, everything is those really good 18-inch high step-ups. Going to get a box, get them to step up 15 times on one leg, and then get them to step up 15 times on the other leg. The lead leg is going to be the one doing all the work for the most part, and it's going to be really attacked. Now, on that, if 18 inches is too high, fine, no worries. You get a step riser or you bring it down to 12 inches. If that's too high, that's fine. You bring it down to six and we just figure out where that's going to be in terms of enough uh, challenge for them. The third and final one, Catherine, that I like to do for muscular endurance of the core and abdominals is sit-ups on the floor. I like to lie them down on, their floor, on the floor on a mat. They're going to be on their back. Their knees are going to be bent. Their feet are going to be flat. Hands can go across the chest or their hands are going to go on the back of the head. And I want them to give me some good full setups and see if they could do that 15 times. And if they could do those three pieces of exercises right there, bam, we've hit a little bit of upper body, a little bit of legs and a little bit of abs and core. I think that's a wonderful way to start with just to get a basic foundation and a good benchmark, uh, kind of like a baseline to see where they're at now and then what our goals will be and say, okay, well, you could do this on push-ups. Here's our progression level. We're going to progress doing push-ups on the feet. Okay, great. You could do a 12-inch step up. Now we want to do, uh, you know, you're able to do it 15 times. I want you to do 20 of them on an 18-inch step up eventually. That's going to be our goal. And then sit-ups. Okay, terrific. You did 15 sit-ups three times consecutively. Well, we're going to go for 25 sit-ups. That's going to be our goal. Or we're going to get you on a ball and do them harder. We're going to get you on a BOSU, create some imbalance. Things of that nature I like to do in terms of really pushing the limit and challenge him so they could push it to the next level. That's great information. So push-ups, step-ups, and sit-ups are a good place to start. There it is right there, the best three. That's go Taren right there, uh, basic foundation. <laughs> and, and we can go to your uh, Instagram site and find the exercise of the day. Will you share with our listeners, what is your Instagram account? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I'd love to. Thanks, Catherine. So if you go on Instagram, if you have an Instagram, just follow me. It's just uh, one word, go Taryn. It's just uh, G-O-T-A-R-R-Y-N. So if you could either go on Instagram and look for me, go Taryn, or you can Google go Taryn Instagram. You'll see me pop up. It'll be up there. So that's great because we all need inspiration. Now, going back to the osteopenia, osteoarthritis, and osteoporosis, what are the signs and symptoms of, of these issues? Okay, so yeah, the signs and symptoms, and let's go back to the doctor's office for a second. When you go in, there's gonna be three things that people are gonna be taking a look at for the signs and symptoms, and the three are low muscular strength, low physical performance, or uh, low muscle mass. And then if you have all three of them, uh, that's gonna be severe sarcopenia. So when you go into the doctor's office and they diagnose you, they're going to be taking a look and seeing if those symptoms and those signs fit to see, you know, if you actually have that. Going a further along on that, uh, Catherine, just for a second, muscle atrophy, just so people know, it's the decrease in the size of the muscle. Okay, so that goes along with uh, reduction in muscle tissue quality. And it's also characterized basically by different muscle fibers with fat, increase in fibrosis 
and changes in muscle, you know, we've talked about changes and decrease in muscle metabolism. Um, and then scientifically, like oxidative stress, uh, degeneration of a neuromuscular junction. So things like that, when they know something's going on, and especially if they're over 50 and more over, like if they're closer to that 67 age, then it's time to get into the doctor and tell them what's going on and get checked and treated for that right away. Right, and I know that our doctors, our wonderful doctors, can actually diagnose osteoporosis. And yes. They mm -hmm. do that with a bone scan. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, Taryn, what is the average age of your clients? Uh, good question, Catherine. So the average age of my clients right now is anywhere between uh, 65 to 85 because predominantly the majority of my clients, I see them at a fitness center called the Family Life Center, which I'm hoping you know that uh, we're going to get you working out there soon and teaching some people. And um, most of the people there are uh, the um, senior citizens who are either going on uh, Medicaid, uh, Medicare, I'm sorry, yeah, that's right, Medicare, uh, AARP, or they're joining something called Silver Sneakers, which Family Life Center at Second Ponce just initiated. And so when I see people of these ages, I will see people who will typically tell me a lot of these symptoms and signs that we're talking about. Most of the times that I see people, it's usually things like osteoporosis or arthritis um, because they're dealing with joint pain. Uh, they're dealing with going, coming back from the doctor who just diagnosed them and saying, yes, you have osteoporosis. You need to make sure you're taking more calcium and uh, check out your nutrition. Are you getting enough vitamin D? And so, uh, you know, those are your more predominant kinds of issues that I see when I'm working with my uh, older clients that are at the family or wherever. I mean, I do a lot of in-home training as well in Buckhead, but um, all the more reason exercise, Catherine, I can't tell you what I tell them more so than anybody younger than them. It's so much more vital and crucial. Like, so if anybody's listening to us right now, if they are over age, let's say 65, it's all the more reason if they're on the fence right now, they're listening to us and they're thinking about maybe possibly joining a gym or getting in the, please go ahead and do it now. I mean, you need to, because again, the research and the evidence, I can't stress it enough is out there. It's conclusive. This is not a theory. This is not a hypothesis. This is actually something that is in black and white. Um, and again, in peer reviewed journal, the, all across the board with research that has shown that strength training is one of the most vital things that can help with longevity and helping us live pain-free and helping us with our muscles, joints, and bones, ligaments, tendons, you name it. That's what's going to help out. Now, as you know, Taryn, there's been research, recent research showing that sitting is actually worse for you than smoking, I believe. Is it worse for you than smoking or as bad as smoking? In my opinion, sitting is a necess necessity during life because we have to drive to get somewhere. We have to sit at these boring conference meetings sometimes if we're out and about. Um, so this is not something in my terms of like saying detrimentally taking a cigarette or a cigar and, and voluntarily inhaling nar uh, nicotine and tar and, and all that kind of stuff. Or even let's take it a step further, things that are really bad like marijuana and pot. I mean, those are things that I believe we're um, intangibly taking a knife and stabbing ourselves and taking some time off of our lives willingly. Now, sitting, okay, yes, I totally agree. And you see it more than I do with your pa uh, clients that come in, um, you know, and doctors that have patients that come see them. No question about it. I deal with back issues all the time. You know, I've told you my issues, L4 and L5, my compressed spine from wrestling, um, you know, it's part of the reason why I had to get out. It's just, we see it a lot of times in people, especially men. I'm talking about that L4 and L5 because of the, the sitting down, the compression, the, the, the meetings, the monotony of sitting there. But what I liked, what you told me, Catherine, I learned so insightful was that relaxo back. So I'm not trying to plug them or give them a plug, but you know, for the sake of it, yeah, let's plug them. That relaxo back is amazing. There are ways to efficiently sit properly, whether you're driving or you and I right now, we're sitting as we're doing this podcast. And, uh, you know, I think that it's in terms of finding things to preventatively treat, um, you know, issues that such as sitting like, okay, I know I need to sit right now. I'm going to have a long drive and I'm driving four hours away to visit some family or whatever. Well, how can I best combat that? Well, I'm going to have my relaxo back. I'm going to put that there. And for the folks listening, Catherine can explain that a lot better. I'm sure you have in your other podcast with talking about better posture and, you know, just better proper form. And, and you know, just telling people sit straight, you know, sit with your shoulders back and your head up. And, and, and that includes when they're doing anything. You know, a lot of times 
you'll have the proverbial person who's watching their football game with a beer in their hand and a cigarette in the other, and they're kind of slouched over and they're like this sitting down from a side view in their couch. And I see that a lot when I'm seeing cl um, clients at the Family Life Punts gym. A lot of the elderly people might be sitting in their chair with their shoulders forward and their chest uh, forwards too. And it's just natural habit. I'm, again, I, I admit I'm very open about it. I'm very transparent. I'm guilty of it myself. I need to constantly correct myself. I need to pretend you're right there with me, Catherine, and just say, sit up, like look straight to Aaron, because I'm constantly having to self-correct during the day. I know how hard that is. But uh, yeah, you know, sitting, to get back to your original question, um, it, it, it's necessary to do, but I'm, you know, Fortunately, I should say there are ways that we can make sure that we sit properly and that's not detrimental to us in the long run. Right. And the relaxo back that Taryn was talking about, the relaxo back is a back cushion that you can purchase. It's about $30 US. I'm not sure what it would cost in the UK that actually puts your lumbar spine, your lower back in a correct position. So it does not compress when you sit. And if you have back pain, um, and again, we're not getting any kickback. So believe me, this is something <laughs> I just recommend for my clients with back pain is to sit on a relaxo back cushion. Now, Taryn, a lot of the people who are going to be listening to this are people who have desk jobs. Yes. So if you have a desk job, do people who have desk jobs need actually more exercise to combat the hours they spend sitting every day or they do, do they need more strength training? What's your professional opinion? You know, I would tell them to do what I do uh, for the folks that are sitting uh, at a desk. I try to do more strengthening exercises on my back. I think I mentioned earlier about um, everything should be in balance and symmetry. I do a lot more rows and pull-ups than I do presses and uh, shoulder military press. And the reason for that, uh, well, you know, especially because what's going on, and you know, Catherine, that spine when you're sitting at that desk is just compressing and it's really, really going down. You know, everything's just the weight bearing on it. So the best things to do, in my opinion, we're already getting enough compression. I don't even do military shoulder presses. If I do, I'll do really lightweight because we get enough compression as it is. I will do some uh, chest and uh, different kinds of push exercises, but my favorite are pull exercises because I feel the benefits of it. Because believe me, I do a lot of driving because I drive a lot. I'm the traveling trainer going from house to house. I have to do a lot of driving in Atlanta, unfortunately, and we know how that traffic is here in the U.S., so what I do in my workouts, I do a lot of pull-ups. I do a lot of seated back rows. I do dumbbell rows. I do any kind of exercises where I'm forced to use my back more so. And for me, I just feel the benefits of that. Now, on top of that, what I like, Catherine, what, and I think I mentioned this to you, is to reverse that compression. I get on my inverted table, and I, what I do, I, I need to do a better job of that, but I try at least a couple times a week is I'll get on my inverted table and flip myself completely upside down vertically. So if anybody knows what I'm talking about, it's kind of like, you remember those anti-gravity boots? Well, it's a table where you literally go in and uh, let's plug Amazon again. I think I bought it for less than a hundred bucks. I'm not a handyman. I was able to assemble this in less than 30 minutes. So if I can do it, anyone out there listening can do it. And I'll tell you what, the benefits of it, I get in there, I can actually feel my spine kind of like traction, kind of decompressing. And the, uh, what I was told by the doctors when I had an MRI on my L4 and L5 was that when you have, a, in my case, a, protrude, a protruding bulging disc, and which could cause uh, herniated discs in my case, well, the best way to combat that is to stretch it and lengthen it. And uh, they didn't tell me to get the inverted table. I actually got that from a chiropractic friend of mine who said to do it. I'm surprised. The, um, you know, I'm not going to get off on a tangent on doctors, but these doctors said, yeah, we could fix that. All we'll do is some surgery. We'll get in there, cut you up, and be able to do that. And I just thought, you know, why don't we try something else first, and I'll let you know. And I never went back, and uh, they wanted to shoot me up with an epidural in the back and such. And I believe me, I, I believe there are things, there are times when we do need stuff like that, for sure. I'm not trying to go on a tangent. But in my case, I like uh, what you like, Catherine, a holistic, an all-natural approach to where your body can help you. And, and let's take it a step further. Kathleen Gramsci, I just got to meet her, thanks to you for the first time. You know, she tells you, you have the power of movement to fix your own body with your own motion and mindfulness. I think that's exactly what it comes down to. You know, I really think that we ha have the opportunity to self-medicate and self-treat ourselves in terms of doing that. And, and again, is there a medicine that's effective for sarcopenia? No, there's not. There's no uh, research or evidence that's shown that anything that a doctor can prescribe to you or inject into your body helps with sarcopenia. 
it all comes back to that all safe, natural healing way of strength training. And then again, what I recommend is somehow getting yourself upside down. It's the only way I could think of to where your spine is actually loosening up because that really helped me out. I like that a lot. Yeah, well, what we say in yoga is someone's in pain, the first thing you have to do is create length and space. Because yes. When there's pain, uh, frequently the discs are compressing. So what you're talking about is a method, one method of creating space. In my book, my most recent book, the eight, my eighth book, The Difference Between Pain and Suffering, I have an appendix in the back with the 41 yoga exercises that I use most often to get people out of pain. You can accomplish the same uh, thing of creating length and space in your spine with a pose called wide leg forward fold. If you don't know what that is, you can get my book, The Difference Between Pain and Suffering. With the wide leg forward fold, you don't even need to have a $100 piece of equipment. You can just use your body and create space. Now, um, so Taryn, what does research show in epidemiology of people over 50 years old? What yeah, uh, good question. So let's go back to the age of uh, over 50 because this is something that I found from the uh, acronym, the EWGSO people, the European Sarcopenia. Um, people and they said, and I'll quote this, that uh, they found, quote, over age 50, they found the UK prevalence of sarcopenia to be 4.6% in men and 7.9% in women. So almost double, right, for females uh, from their approach. And then another study, quote, uh, they conducted this one in the United States among older adults with an average age of 70.1 years, found that the prevalence of sarcopenia to be 36.5%. And uh, again, still on that same quote, sarcopenia affects about half of people over 80 in one state in the United States. That's pretty powerful. So I thought that was pretty interesting that that shows you that uh, definitely it is more prevalent in women than men, almost double, not quite double, but uh, again, 7.9% to 4.6%. And then they said that it was almost half of the people in one state of uh, the folks who are over age 80. And then they also said in the US, it was for people who are over age, they say 70.1, let's just round it, 70 years basically. So it's right in that ballpark, that sweet spot is what we're talking about uh, for the folks. I thought that was really insightful that they have the uh, research there. And everything's right there on that EWGSOP website. I think that's great that they have that. They seem to be the standard of taking uh, charge on this. Now, let's talk about for a moment about nutrition and the yeah. role that plays in, in muscle loss. Mm -hmm. so from my understanding and working with clients, anytime you're eating foods that cause inflammation in the body, anytime you have pain, you have inflammation. And inflammation is, be, begins in your gut. It begins in with what you eat. Um, and w the more foods that you eat that are pro-inflammatory that cause inflammation, the more muscle loss you're going to have, the more osteoporosis and osteoarthritis uh, and osteopenia you're going to have. So these pro-inflammatory foods would be caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, sugar, fried foods, and gluten. What, when you're working with someone and they're your client, so treat our audience like your clients. What do you tell them to eat and not to eat in order to build muscle and avoid muscle wasting? Mm -hmm. good, good question, Catherine. So the role of nutrition is very unclear with uh, things like sarcopenia. So if the folks listening are my clients right now and I'm telling them, okay, what is the be all and end all to eating right? It's what you just said in addition, because again, we don't want to have detrimental uh, deterrents such as like you just named them off, alcohol, caffeine, because it shows, the evidence has shown that that is nothing positive at all in our body. In fact, it takes away. Um, and so what people need to be careful of is those things. Now, the things that they should be eating more of is, and again, and here in the United States, I can clearly tell, and you as well, I'm sure, we do not get enough vegetables, especially dark green leafy vegetables. Now, all I'm approaching it from, by the way, is from what the textbooks tell me. Everything that I've learned growing up and for what I'm educated on in my courses and lecturing on is right from the website choosemyplate.gov, and that's the USDA's recommendation of a, a well-balanced diet. What I like, Catherine, about their example is that they show a perfectly round plate, and they challenge everyone, half of it, to be 
fruits and vegetables. And the bigger half of that other half, by the way, is the vegetables and then the fruits. And then the other half, they tell you to eat natural things like, um, you know, whole grains, whole wheat, uh, et cetera, things like that, while being careful of that gluten. We know that for sure. And also, of course, with the processed refined foods. But the closest thing that I like that uh, even remotely comes close to that is your typical caveman diet, paleo diet, where it's coming naturally from the ground or from the tree to where man hasn't touched it as less as possible. Um, there's a great company here in Atlanta called 2U Medical, uh, Linda McEver, and we talked about this all the time. Uh, she always uh, tells all of her clients the same thing, what I just mentioned is the less that man or women has touched the food to be processed to the shelf to where it's going to be consumed the better. I totally agree with that because I'm all for an all, all organic, um, you know, non-GMO approach to where everything that we're putting in our body is as whole and as natural uh, as possible. For people with sarcopenia, back to my clients listening for a second, if this is something that you're dealing with, um, they, the doctors do recommend, if anything, to have a higher protein-based uh, diet in, in that terms. So if you're a little deficient in protein, they're going to tell you to supplement with protein. You could do that in many ways, uh, you could do that naturally with Greek yogurt, with some handful of raw almonds, um, maybe even some light string cheese. In my case, I like the protein bars. I like the protein drinks. I keep them in my office and in my car all the time. Um, and then also, in addition to that, is increasing your vitamin D intake because there is a correlation, they say, with your muscle uh, bone and um, cell growth. To minerals for a second, they do say calcium and magnesium. They've shown benefits of that as well in the digestive system for being able to maintain a strong bone and muscular uh, structure. Now you mentioned that women, that we women have twice, we're twice as likely to have muscle loss. As right. Men. And yes. yet a lot of women, if you go to the average gym, you're going to see more men lifting weights than women. Why is it that women um, really can't get big and bulky in general? The word that starts with T, uh, Catherine. So mainly it comes down to testosterone. This is interesting you asked that. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about, by the way, because, and we should do another, next time you have me on the show, I'd love to do a whole show on this one. Here's my little snapshot summary of it. Anybody who's listening out there, especially women who are afraid of, uh, you know, bulking up and saying that, you know, they're going to get big and, and I have this constant talk all the time whenever I'm signing up a new woman client. You don't have the testosterone unless you're taking anabolic steroids or a growth hormone. Uh, there, you know, it just simply doesn't happen. Women are programmed more and wired with estrogen, whereas men were born with testosterone. So therefore, uh, when you break it down scientifically, the muscle hypertrophy that a man has is going to be much greater because the cells, the size of the muscles can get a lot larger than the women's who women for the most part are working on leaning and toning up anyway you always hear that that's just generalization and whereas the men i was skinny all my life growing up i wanted to quote bulk up and the way to do that was you know again i'm lucky because uh in terms of that being my goal i have the testosterone to be able to do that now i do not recommend at all anyone listening to go and take the approach of especially women if you're wanting to bulk up don't take testosterone therapy and you know all that unnatural stuff if you're really looking to get bulky and a little bit more, you could go on a power program, for example. You could really lift some heavy weights and really work on your negatives and do some eccentric work on your negatives, doing them real slowly. That might have a little bit of benefit. Now, naturally speaking, I don't like to prescribe supplementation. I myself have found creatine to be very helpful. Creatine monohydrates, very safe when you're taking it in moderation, doing it effectively by the dosage, just like anything else, you know. And so um, back to the original question, again, it just comes down to the fact that women don't have the testosterone that men have, and therefore they just don't get in general as big as men can um, to their potential of muscle growth. Hypertrophy, that's what it comes down to. And, and we're talking about the benefits of strength training. So for men, especially men as they age, as men age, as, as we all age, our hormone levels drop. So how can strength training help men with their testosterone level? Yeah, and it, you know, that's the way to boost it. If it don't, you know, men listening, please don't let the doctors try to talk you into testosterone hormone therapy and boosting it this way with this natural, you know, supplement they've come out with. Personally, I strongly believe, you know, just 
the, read the research and the evidence that show conclusively that's what strength training does. Strength training does boost metabolism and boost testosterone, and it gets the endorphins up, and it reduces stress physiologically in the body. This is what's going on. It's a biological, um, you know, uh, occurrence basically it's pure chemistry and that's what's happening so if, uh, you could tell from talking to me Catherine we know uh, I'm very all natural I, I don't like to say well yeah you could go and get this great testosterone boost therapy does that stuff work yes in my opinion is the evidence long range enough for us to see how the effects are either positively or you know conversely to that I don't think there's enough uh, and, and again that goes for both the US and the UK I don't think that this is a topic too that is another of discussion that we could probably do a whole blog on because I'll tell you, uh, I'm a huge big mixed martial arts fan. I love to watch the uh, cage fighting for the folks listening. It's kind of like UFC or Bellator. It's where the folks get in there. And, and one of the things they've been cracking down on lately is this testosterone uh, growth uh, hormone therapy as well. Not only that, but before that, you know, Catherine, here in the U.S., we had the big problem of the NFL football players and then the Major League Baseball players, too. Everybody was hitting all those home runs, and then they figured out, oh, it's because of the anabolic steroids that they were all taking. And so from that aspect, you know, it, it, something, you know, everybody always wants to get the edge. You know, your Lance Armstrongs who got in trouble with the blood doping and anything like this. You could take any field or any sport or industry, and there's always going to be some way to try to cut corners and to try to, you know, get ahead by doing some things that probably aren't right. And my only advice to that is you don't need to do it. Um, you know, again, uh, I believe firmly that do people possibly need testosterone hormone therapy? Yeah, certainly they do. But there's uh, healthy, maintainable levels. If you are a healthy, back to the original question, man who is working out and they want more testosterone, the best way to do it is to get in that gym, get on and check out how your strength training is, and then go back to your aerobic training. So we talked about aerobic earlier. Are you getting enough aerobic exercise? Are you getting enough sleep? How is your nutrition? Everything that we've pretty much been talking about for the last um, so many minutes here, this is something like a total package that men and women need to take a look at and see an accountability of how they're doing on that. So you've been listening to Master Trainer Taryn Hoff. You can find out more about Taryn at gotaryn.com. That's G-O-T-A-R-R-Y-N.com. This is Catherine Kerrigan. Medical Intuitive Healer and Amazon number one best-selling author. You can find out more about me and my work at KatherineKerrigan.com and UnlimitedEnergyNow.com. And remember, one of the ways that you can heal yourself naturally is to do strength training, beginning with those three basic exercises, uh, uh, push-ups, step-ups, and sit-ups. You can do it. Thanks so much for listening to The Natural Healing Show. We'll see you next time.